Good morning. Holy and beautiful is the custom which brings us together in the presence of God to claim our hope, to give thanks and make confession, to offer forgiveness, to be enlightened with the truth that makes us free. Let us now make room in our hearts and our lives for the God in Jesus Christ who promises to be with us today and every day. We welcome you to our worship service. We hope you, your time with us will be empowering and uplifting as you are assured that you are loved by God, a good and gracious God. Whether you are here or at home, may we come together in worship. Are there any announcements? Good morning. Good morning. Several announcements. Right uh, at 11.30 this morning, there will be a sacred conversations con um, session in the living room. It's also going to be online, so it's a hybrid se session. If you've never come before, you're more than welcome to join us. So that'll be at 11.30. That gives you time to go down and have some fellowship and something to drink and eat. Also, a couple of other announcements. On February 14th, the Super Bowl of Caring is happening. Our youth will be collecting coins, and they'll gladly take things that fold too, like checks and bills. Um, so that'll be right after the worship service that they'll be taking that collection. And then that afternoon at 4 p.m., Mad Agnes will be here, a group that's very well known, and they will be doing a concert here uh, at 4 p.m. that Sunday. So we hope you can join us for, for that. I was planning to preach until 12, I mean. How are they going to make it at 11.30? Okay. We'll adjust. I readjust. <laughs> Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the call to worship. Jesus said, come unto me. We have come to experience the presence of Christ. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples. When we leave, we will say to others, come and see. God be with us as we gather and as we scatter, as we come and as we go. Let us worship our God. Our opening hymn.
us continue with our unison prayer. Heavenly Creator, your spirit calls and gathers us from the four corners of creation. For us to be this place to praise your name with song and prayer, with a message and with our gifts. Turn our hearts toward you. Fill us, equip us for your service in a hurting world. Amen. Our prayer of dedication. Living God, who gave the whole world the gift of your Son, receive what we offer that others might know the new life he brings through the gifts you give us to use and share. Amen. Let's offer the peace of God to each other. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. <laughs> Go, girl. <laughs> I myself as well. Yes, I taught you. Now, do you think that that's what Jesus meant for us to do? Go throw a net over somebody and drag them in? No, that's not what Jesus meant at all. Jesus meant to go fishing for people with love, with joy, with acceptance, with justice and peace. We don't need a net.
Well, this promises to be a uplifting worship. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Now it's time for prayer. Prayer that we take seriously at this church. We pray for ourselves. We pray for other people. We pray for all nations. We pray for our youth. We pray for a closer and deeper relationship with God. And that what prayer does. Loving God. Christmas and Epiphany have come and gone. And now we find ourselves in ordinary time. And the ordinary can be the most trying of all. There are days it feels as if we have little to look forward to, except the long, damp, and cold months ahead. The days are still short. And though we know they are beginning to lengthen, and though the sun does shine on some days, the trees are barren, the flowers are not, blooming outside, and spring is a long way off. So help us to live and love the time that is now ours. It is all too easy for us to crank our necks ahead. Look longing for another time and season, while missing what is ours to know and enjoy today. We are now in a new year, a new time, and there are things from the past year. We regret actions taken or not taken, thoughtless words spoken, or words we failed to speak because we were afraid that people would disapprove. And yet you call us to speak and act in faith and courage. You do not demand uniformity of belief, only a uniformity of love that can embrace those who neither believe, think, nor act the way we do. You made room for everyone, so show us how to follow your lead in Jesus Christ. We pray for our world and all its worry and torment, especially for those places where justice is long in coming and war and violence speak so much louder than peace and reconciliation. We pray for all who suffer from cruelty and oppression in any form and ask you to show us the path forward through Christ who makes life new. We lift up those whom we know to be in special need. At this time, you may lift up your individual petitions to God aloud or in the silence of your hearts. Lift up your names now. Charles. Leah, Asia, Longfield Church, Pastor Sean, Safety in our schools. Those who are in recovery programs. We ask all of this in the name of and spirit of Jesus, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our 
our scripture reading for today. Matthew 4, 13 through 23. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, to Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death Light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. Sparrow us, O oh God, with your truth. Open our minds and our hearts to your word and to the very good news that you love us and call us by name and that we belong to you forever in Jesus Christ. Remove from me any obstacle to the people of God hearing your word this morning. Amen. I am fascinated by the sentences in this passage that says, now when Jesus heard that, God, that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea. I don't often think of Jesus as an adult having a home. I followed him in Nazareth, learning at the synagogue, and having friends there. I have followed him apprenticing with his father, leaving home as a young man. I imagine him staying with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Bethany, traveling to Jerusalem for festivals, one wonder wandering with no place to lay his head. But I never thought of him having a home where he invited people to eat his food, to listen, and talk. I never thought of Jesus having a door you could knock on in the middle of the night, a place with neighbors from which to go out and return. It was m even more interesting how he got there. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. 
John's arrest sets Jesus' work in motion. In response, Jesus does what he will do in Matthew many times when there is conflict. He withdraws, pulls back, finds a more hospitable place to begin his work. It is not exactly management by confrontation. Jesus' parents had fled to Egypt when Herod was about to kill young children, and then a new home in Nazareth where there were strangers. Jesus now go to Capernaum where folks aren't all stirred up about John and makes his home. Capernaum was on the road by the sea. The water was blue, and it was an easy place from which to travel. There were many Gentiles who lived there. Matthew was writing to a church that was full of Gentiles, foreigners to the Jews. Here he shows that even at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was a light to the Gentiles. If the Jews and the Gentiles could worship together, live together anywhere, it would be in Capernaum by the sea, where Isaiah had foretold it long ago, long ago. So having made his home in Capernaum, Jesus began to preach and gather his first followers. It is the barest message, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What that means will be revealed as the story unfolds. The Greek word for repent means to change your mind. It's related to the Hebrew concept of repenting as turning around or going in a different direction. But where the Hebrew is always concrete, describing complex ideas to bodily movements, turn away. The Greek reminds us that repentance is not just a change in behavior, it is an eternal reversal of how we think and how we look at the world. Jesus is going fishing. Jesus is in the business of changing minds. One day by the sea, Peter and Andrew are fishing, and James and John are mending their nets. Jesus stops and says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Matthew doesn't offer us any sermons that they might have heard, any miracle they might have witnessed. We don't know why they respond, but they change their minds about the focus of their lives, change their actions, and turn their attention to a whole different life. They won't fish for fish anymore. From now on, they will look for signs of God's kingdom and help others seek God's power among them. When Jesus says, follow me, they are caught by him like fish, and they take the bait and follow. Jesus' first followers had to change their minds about the Gentiles. For so long they had imagined and were so assured that the Gentiles out, were outside the circle of God's chosen one. For so long they had imagined, for so long. And now the Gentile responded to Jesus with a more fervor than the original group. It was beginning to look like the kingdom of heaven would include both groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. 
Could Matthew's church repent and follow, even though it was all so strange and new to them? Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. What can you tell me about the disciples of Jesus? The question dropped out of the air only seconds after the starting bell, landing a loud splat on the members of the freshman New Testament class. It was the second week of seminary in a very warm and humid September. Many of the class were half asleep. Others sat in crippling fear that the professor would single them out to respond to the question. I knew that the answer had been in the homework for the day, homework I had been very careful to prepare. Being new to seminary, and ballistic with anxiety. The fidgeting that rushed around me revealed that most of the class had not done the reading. And I wasn't the only one in the room who knew that. Dead silence. The professor looked from one face to the other, his gaze fixing on each student's eyes in a sort of optical half Nelson. As silence continued, now and then punctuated with a half-hearted cough, he became more and more animated. Think now, he admonished, think. What work do the disciples do before they even become disciples? Tomb-like silence. Finally, a hand rose in the back of the room. They were fishermen, came a timid voice. Fishermen, the professor acknowledged, is the correct response. Again, the search-like gaze. Why does Jesus choose fishermen? Again, the heavy silence. I go hoping I would not be singled out to respond because I had no clue about why and how Jesus might behave or act. Then a flash of ins insight. Fishermen, men who made their living outdoors by hard physical labor. Men who were sturdy, masculine, masculine, perhaps even graceful in their movements, men in short who look like the professor. You wouldn't think Jesus would choose low-class laborers, he observed. He's the son of God, after all. He can have anyone he wants as disciples. But Jesus called fishermen. Because they aren't rich or powerful, these fishermen had credibility and could talk to others like themselves, the people Jesus came to and for in the first place. The student next to me raised his hand. If Jesus lives in here in Chicago right now, he asked, do you think he would pick steel workers to be disciples? A bright smile from the professor. You get the idea, he beamed. To me, whose very limited comprehension of the Bible was confined to Sunday school stories of the Old Testament patriarchs and a little synopsis of Jesus' ministry, this explanation made sense. Remember this, the professor continued, if disciples are fishermen, then being disciples is going fishing for people. And if fishermen can be disciples, so can you. I tell this story 
because it represents one of the most powerful aha moments of my life. Who of us at some time or another has not thought about disciples, about the disciples, as terribly exalted and blessed? Even though Jesus could call anyone, he chose these particular people, finding in them potential that they do not recognize in themselves. Matthew tells us that Jesus sees Simon, Andrew, James, and John, and tell them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Matthew does not record their reactions. He simply reports, Jesus calls for men, goes around the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogue, proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Here's people, heal people of their sickness and diseases. No heavenly trumpet sounds, no earthly voice boom from the clouds, no thunder and lightning punctuate the scene. It's also deceptively simple. Jesus goes fishing, catches people, then tells them they will do the same. Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Psychology tells us that our fundamental concepts about the world, is it a safe place? Are people basically good or bad? What is a role? Are concepts we form early in life and generally do not change. True repentance changing of our mind and direction is a rare and surprising thing. Although sometimes it is a conscious, a conscious discipline choice, often it is a force that takes you by surprise, pulls you along, almost happens to you when you find yourself responding to the world in a new way. It nearly always comes as a shock. What makes people change their mind? Turn away from thoughts or behavior or behavior that is destructive or wrong. What makes us even admit the possibility of change? How do we move from seeing the world? as a competition where we had better make sure we come out on top to a place where everyone has a seat at the table. How does that happen? What makes us move from having to earn every penny and every friend we have to the confidence of knowing that we and all people are infinitely loved? How does that happen? What makes us move from believing nothing is new under the sun to affirming that God is doing a new thing among us? According to Jesus, it is the kingdom of heaven. When God's reign draws near enough to feel, near enough to see, then you begin to see your life as it is. You begin to figure out when you are walking around in the dark or spending your energy on things that don't count. You don't want to sit there any more than Peter and Andrew wanted to sit in their boat once they heard Jesus call to them. You might leave what you thought was home all along that deals with the world. That plan of how you will live and change your life and change your mind about a lot of things. Then you find yourself at home, maybe for the first time, seeing the world as a place where God's reign, in the community that fishes for people and bring them in. You'll never wanna go back. 
Sometimes you can't even imagine what took you so long to get there. There are all kinds of things we need to repent. We need to change our minds about. Need to turn away from. There are big things and little things. Private things and public things. There is racism and exclusion that doesn't die with some people. There are silent angers. The well-nursed resentments the behaviors that harms our bodies. The kingdom of heaven is near, right close to us. We don't want to be stuck in our old lives, in our old thoughts when it arrives. The only reasonable thing to do is to get out of our boat, leave our nets, and allow ourselves to be hooked to follow the one who lived at Capernaum, walked by the sea, brought light to the Gentiles. We wouldn't want to be left behind, would we? May it be so. It is time for our offering. Giving is always an opportunity here, never an obligation. We are working to make this world better. If you feel moved to help us to do that, there are a number of ways to do that. Click the Give button on our website. Use the Thai.ly app. Scan the QR symbol on the back of this bulletin or found in other locations. Or place a gift in one of our baskets at the church. You may also send a donation by mail. Now our offertory musical offering.
we give thanks for this opportunity to give our offerings. And we know that a loving God blesses us each and every day. And now we ask God for another blessing, that we might be wise stewards of what we both give and receive. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for the opportunity to come here. This is always a blessing for me. Our closing hymn is God of Grace and God of Glory. May we prepare our hearts and minds for the benediction. May the deep peace of water, air, and earth remind you of this world's beauty, which God blesses and recreates each day. Go now with God's blessings and God's beauty in your heart. Amen. Our post will.
Oh, thank you. You are so sweet. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. Thank you.